do part two, keys, keys, keys to the blessed life, keys to your blessed life. What does that mean? Jesus promised keys to the kingdom. I have a set of keys. I think they're in the back room. On my set of keys, my car key, house key, uh, my office, this building. I think there's one or two other keys on there. I did something funny uh, two months ago. I was in Mexico City. I stayed in one hotel because I was doing a men's conference. Then I had to go way across town, and you got 28 million people, so it's not easy. So I checked into another hotel. Well, I'm tired. I got confused, and I, I, <laughs> I kept the, you know, the little card, hotel card. I, I had it mixed up with the new hotel. And I went to my room, and I'm trying, to, I'm trying, and I'm tired, and I'm getting a little cranky, and the thing won't work. It keeps beep, 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 coming up red, and I go downstairs. And I put the card down, and I go, senor, mi amigo, muy malo, this don't work. And he looked at it, and he goes, you got the wrong hotel. And I, I said, oh. I said, I'm so sorry, and I looked, and I found the right car. See, I, the thing is, to walk in the blessings, you got to have the right keys. So let's talk about that a little bit. Let's review for just a moment last Sunday, where we talked, our narrative last Sunday was Luke 6, 27 through 36, or through 30, 38, actually, I think it was. And we, we don't want to, uh, for sake of time, but... Let's just cut to the chase and, and, and throw up on the screen what we talked about. The, the whole narrative there was on giving. What, <laughs> what I said last Sunday was uh, the first step, the first key, the first key, the master key, if you will, to a life of blessing is you got to learn how to be a giver. Then I asked this question, Jesse, how many of you think I'm talking about money? And I know most of you wanted to lift your hand because Luke 6 and 38 Usually when that is shared, it's during the offering time. Given, it shall be given, pressed down, shaken together, running over. And, and, that's, and that's okay, and there's truth in that. But if you, if you look at these nine or ten verses, which all has to do with giving, Jesus is talking about giving love to your enemies, blessing those who curse you, giving blessing, giving goodness whenever you can, giving kindness giving forgiveness, giving mercy. And yes, he throws in there money, even though he doesn't use the word money. He alludes to the fact that there are people that need, like yesterday, a handout. That Carla was, Carla was giving out $20 bills. And I said, hey, take that out of your purse. Leave my wallet alone. <laughs> I've already bought 10, 10 of these dinners. Anyway, it's all good. But now, watch now. We, we talked a little bit about the law of sowing and reaping or the reciprocal law. Let's go to Luke 6 again and 38. He finishes our narrative by saying simply give. And he's not just talking about money. And it will be given to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your bosom, your life. For with the same measure or the way you give it, it will come back to you. In other words, you give love, love comes back. You give a smile, smiles come back. You give mercy, blessed are the merciful, they shall obtain mercy. You give grace, you give forgiveness, you're going to get forgiveness, right? And we give money, and the Bible does promise that, you know, that God will take care of us, open the windows of heaven, and all these and we'll talk about that. We'll, we'll un unwrap that uh, in some detail a little bit later. But he also warned us about condemnation and judgment. In other words, you give condemnation, condemnation is going to come back. You judge, judgment's coming back. You gossip, gossip's coming back. You give hate, hate's coming back. Whatever you give, it will come back. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, even running over. So it's a blessing and it's a warning to make sure... We give correctly. All right, let's move on to part two. John 10, the gospel of St. John. Let's read a little bit. Starting in verse one. Most assuredly, Jesus talking. I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold, underscore that, by the door or the correct door, but climbs up some other way or breaks in, 
The same as a thief and a robber, but he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger. I'm going to tell a funny story in a moment of what happened to me in Israel a few years back. But they'll flee from him. For they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this illustration. Watch now. But they did not understand. They did not understand the things which he spoke to them, which was not uncommon. So Jesus said to them again, listen, most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, false prophets, what have you. But the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. He will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come. The thief, Satan, the devil, does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I, Jesus speaking, have come that they, you, may have life. Life. Say life. life. Say it like you have some. Life, life, the life of God, literally Zoe, the life of God, and that they may have it, not just have life and a good life, but have life more abundantly. He's talking about the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Jesus gave his life that we might find life, have life, and then he says, not just, not just an existence, not just get by, but a life of blessing. And he even uses the word abundance. Let me take you to the screen. Let's break down this word so we understand what he was talking about. Throw, that, throw the word abundance up there, fellas. It's the Greek word uh, parisos. The prefix, interesting. The, the prefix is P-E-R-I. A very interesting word. It, it means, in the Greek language, through and through, or all around and all over. Go to the next slide, if you would, please. We get the word peri, scope. How many times have you seen a movie like Captain, you know, or a periscope? And what does he do? What does he do? He, he's doing this, right? He's looking all around for either friendly ships or enemy ships. It brings the objects into a bigger view. And so the word parisos really means that God wants you blessed thoroughly, all around, everything about your life, everything about your family, everything, everything around you and in you and hopefully through you, you're a blessing. Amen. He told Abraham, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless you crazy. Like why? So then you can become a blessing. I was thinking about this in the back room, the word period, period, P-E-R-I, right? O-D. So I looked it up. We know what it, we know what it is, but I, I wanted to get a good definition. Watch now. Period. This is the dictionary. When someone says something and it's the final word. P-E-R-I-O-D. So when Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, period. Period. Final. I have final say. Interesting. Interesting. All right, so here's my question to you. Because I pray for a lot of people that they say, I'm a believer, I'm a Christian, but my life's not blessed. I'm, I'm depressed. I'm going through this. I, I, I have a hard time paying my bills. So where is the disconnect? Is Jesus a preacher years ago, and I never forgot this. He said, Jesus is one of three things, lunatic, liar, or Lord. Now, you're, uh, you're at church on one of the busiest Sundays of the year, which means probably you think he's Lord. Am I right about that? All right. I hope, I hope so anyway. I hope so. But there are people that believe he was crazy uh, or he was the biggest liar that ever lived or he's Lord. So if you and I believe that he's Lord, that he is truth, thy, thy word and thy way is truth, and then when he says, I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly. So where's the disconnect? 
Was he making something up or are we doing something wrong? Because I've had to ask myself that question over the years at times. Let's back up. The, the Pharisees in, in our narrative here, in John 10, the Pharisees saw themselves as the true pastors of God's people, Israel. The, in other words, the keepers, the keepers, the keepers of, of the law, the, the, the guardians of, of, of Moses and the, and the law. In the preceding uh, chapter, uh, Jesus heals a blind man. This is in John 9. And the Pharisees grill this guy because they're mad because they hate Jesus. And they're mad thinking maybe the, the man's a liar. He never was blind, whatever. So look at John 9, 24. We'll read a little bit. So they again call this man who was blind and said to him, give God glory. We know that this man, Jesus, this man talking about Jesus, he's a sinner. He answered and said, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I know, I was blind and now I see. Amen. Praise God. Then they said to him again, well, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? Like, who cares? I was blind and now I see. But religious people always want to make sure you're living up to their perception of religious rules and dogmas. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He answered, <laughs> I love verse 27. He answered and said, I told you already. Remember, the man's blind. He's looking at these jokers. I told you already. You and you did not listen. He's rebuking them. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples? Listen, Pharisees, didn't, aren't, Pharisees weren't used to being talked back to. And this man is giving them the what for. Down in verse 28, he, they reviled him and said, you are his disciple. We're, we're Moses' disciple. <laughs> Verse 34. Now they answered and said to him, you were born in sins. In other words, you're still a liar. You were never blind. You're making this up. And are teaching us, you're teaching us. So they excommunicated him, which means they would never let him back in the temple, but he could care less. <laughs> It's like, y'all go back to your religion. I'm going to go look at the color red. I'm going to go look at the color blue. I'm going to go see what green looks. I was blind and now I see. I'm going to go look at the stars. I'm going to look. Y'all go argue. Y'all go argue whatever you want down to your school of theology. I'm going to go look at stuff. Now, Jesus is highlighting in our story what most people already knew. The Pharisees were religious imposters, hypocrites, thieves, robbers, mistreating the flock of God and dishonoring the Father. Let me ask you a question. Back in, back in uh, John 10, or up in John 10, he's talking about thieves and robbers. If somebody breaks into your house or apartment, why? I mean, why would somebody want to break into your house or apartment? Larry, what are they looking for? They're, they're robbers. They're looking, they're look, especially this time of year, wow. Especially that people are taking packages off front doors. They're stealing presents. You got you to lock your car, put your stuff in your trunk. People break windows. These are thieves. These are, these are bottom dwellers. These are people. Yeah, they need prayer. They need prayer. They also need to go to jail and get saved in jail. But they're thieves. They're robbers. And so Jesus, Jesus is comparing religious hypocrites as thieves and robbers, robbing God of glory, robbing God of truth. Yeah. So, but, he, but he's likening himself, he's likening himself to the good shepherd. He talks, about, he talks about sheep love the shepherd and sheep know his voice. Now, when he said sheepfold, if you could picture, I wish I, wish I would have had a, a, a diagram, but back when there was better ones, they traveled, put their tent up, and then they had, like David would be a shepherd. The shepherd would have to spend all night with the sheep. That's back, that was back a thousand years before Christ when they were basically Bedouins going from pasture to pasture. But now in Jesus' time, where there's a city and it's becoming urban and more what we might say domestic, if you will, the shepherd would actually have a house, a house. He would build the sheepfold. There's the, the inner gate. There's the patio where they live. They call it the outer gate, sheepfold. And he would build, he would build like a corral. And the only way to get to the sheep, you had to go through the front door. You had to either have a key because you were given a key or you would knock up the door and you're allowed into the sheep because maybe you're, maybe you're the one that's, that's fleecing. Maybe you're the one that's 
fixing or like a veterinarian today, but you could only get to the sheep with the owner's permission. Are you following me? The others would, would, would break in and steal the sheep or whatever. And so that's, that's what he's talking about. And then he says, <laughs> my, my sheep know my voice. All right, let me take you back about 15 years ago to Israel. Let me show you a picture 15 years ago. Now, do you notice the sheep aren't looking at me? Now, I, yeah, that was, I, and I was doing a teaching. I, I was doing a teaching, I think, out of this same portion of scripture, John 9, John 10, to, uh, we had about 120 people on tour that year. Now, what happened, my, my creative TV guy, Richard, he goes, hey, pastor, what would really be a good shot for a TV program, if you can get in the middle of the sheep, and, and, and maybe they'll look at you like lovingly and longingly. <laughs> So we actually paid, I don't know, $20, $40. We paid the shepherd. There's about 100 sheep. We, <laughs> we paid the shepherd to get out of my shot. And so I worked my way into the sheep. And they're getting nervous. And right about the time I decided there was an alpha ram. There was about three of them, but this guy had huge horns. He come charging at me. I didn't see him. He waited until I turned my back on him. He charged and lifted me off the ground. He hit me, you know where. <laughs> lifted me off the ground, Bible flying. And then he gave me the skank eye. <laughs> he turned his head and, and basically I read his mind. You are not our shepherd. We don't know your voice and we ain't giving you a photo opportunity. <laughs> So, you know what those sheep were looking at right there? Their shepherd. Not some joker from San Jose, California. With a pretty good tan, but that's about it. That's about it. <laughs> I was at the Bank of America, gosh, a few years ago, and it was a Saturday, and, and it was busy, and I'm kind of mad at myself. I should have done this this week. Big, long line. I think it was the holidays. And I'm standing in line, and, and there's like one teller, like one teller, like well, where is everybody at? And so I'm getting a little bit of an attitude. But I'm talking, I'm, in fact, I think I'm, me and a friend are kind of, uh, we're kind of arg not arguing, we're talking about they need to hire some people, this bank. All of a sudden, African-American lady, about five people in front of me, my pastor! <laughs> and she, she spins around, I know that voice anywhere. And remember, I, I was complaining and... Uh, and you know, and the guy I'm talking to goes, you're a pastor? <laughs> I said, tomorrow morning I am. <laughs> and when she gets done with her business, she comes, my pastor, she's hugging me. I'm introducing him to my new friend. And she goes, I recognized your voice. I said, well, you're one of Jubilee sheep, then God bless you. To live a blessed life, we must hear his voice. Amen? We got to hear his voice. Paul said, the world is not without many voices and none insignificant. The devil's got a voice. The world's got a voice. Your flesh has got a voice. TV people got a voice. Uh, every, everybody's got opinions. Everybody's, uh, there, there's politicians. They're trying to get your ear either side of the aisle. There, there's people trying to sell you something for Christmas. I mean, ads and, and billboards and everybody, everybody is screaming at you, yelling at you, whispering to you, talking to you, trying to get your business, trying to get your opinion, trying to get your vote. Are you following me? Yes, Jesus is trying to get your heart. He's trying to get your heart. He's trying to get your heart. Let's go to John 1 real quick. Almost done. In the beginning was the word, the word, I love this. The word was with God. The word was God. Wow. He was in the beginning talking about Christ with God, the Father. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made in him was life. There you go. And the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not, does not comprehend or understand it. it. Now listen, right now, you're hearing Dick Brunel's voice. But if you have discernment, when I'm quoting scripture, 
you're really hearing the voice of God simply using my vocal cords. When I'm quoting the words of Jesus, it's Jesus talking to you. He's using me. I'm, I'm a messenger. He's using me, but it's Jesus talking to you. And, and when you say, wow, pastor, that, that sermon really ministered to me. That's the Holy Spirit using my goofy voice and, and packaging it and getting it into your heart to change your life. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. You got to listen for heaven's echo. We were talking about that in the back, the back room, but and I'm not, I'm not mad at anybody. I'm not, I'm not you know, murmuring, complaining. But people who claim to be Christians, but they, they rarely read the word, which is the, you know, the word of God, the voice of God, or, or listen to a preacher, or, or come to church. And yet, and, and, and you look at their life, it's like, I mean, you could tell why their life is messed up. It's like, come on, man, get in the Bible. Let's pray, get into church, get into a small group. But they're busy, 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 busy. But when they get in trouble, they want prayer. And it's like, I'm going to pray for you, all right? I'm going to pray that you get more miserable. So you will finally give your heart to Christ. I mean, why would I pray for God to bless you and comfort you when you're doing everything that violates blessings from heaven? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's wrap this up with Deuteronomy where we were last week. Now, remember... God was talking about to his people Israel, hard-hearted, stiff-necked people. God was, God was laying out this, this law in Deuteronomy that we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're not going to allow abject poverty to be in my people Israel because they're going to make some bad investments. The crops aren't going to grow, what have you. So every seven years, there's going to be the year of release. Remember, there's going to be the year of release where all debts are canceled. Every 50 years, lands or every uh, kit that you, 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 could, you could actually rent your kids, rent, you could rent yourself into what, what we would call slavery. They called it something else. But at the year of Jubilee, all debts are canceled. Everybody gets their land back. God, God was constantly leveling the playing field so that everybody would get a second chance or even a third chance, a fourth chance, because God didn't want the rich to get richer, blessed, but not you know, living in opulence. And God didn't want you know, people struggling to get into poverty. So God added to the law, pretty brilliant actually, in Deuteronomy 15 and 7, is there, if there, not is there, if there, of course there is, a poor man of your brethren, somebody you know, might be a family member, within any of the gates in your land, which, now watch this, this is key, which the Lord God is giving you. Like you didn't get this land on your own. This is called, this is a promised land. Milk and honey, I gave it to you. It was a gift. You shall not harden your heart, nor shut your hand from your poor brother or neighbor. Notice again, it's a gift. It's not like, well, this is my land, and this, these are my grapes, and this is my money. God says, whoa, 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 who gave you the land? Who's growing those grapes? Who lets the sun come up? Who lets the rain come? You're blessed because I say you're blessed. You got land because I gave you land. Your heart's still beating. You know why, Jesse? You know why, Jesse, you're still here? Because God says you're still here. God wants you still here. Victor, you know why you're being healed? You know why you're going through? You know why you're still alive, Victor? There's people, there's people in this church that really, it's a miracle you're still alive. But it ain't over until God says it's over. This is not, people say, I'm going over to see Dick's church. This is not my church. This is God's church. I work for him. And I'm blessed to be here. I never forget that. I never forget how blessed this is all from God. Amen. Amen. Everything we have, this, this jacket, these shoes, this belt, it's gifts from God. It's from God. everything I have. I still got hair. It's a gift from God. No offense. <laughs> Jesse, God doesn't cover what's beautiful, right? So, <laughs> all right, let's get back to before I, before I lose you, let's get back to this. Now, I'm going to say one thing real quick. I, I, I don't know if I'm right. I think I'm right. By nature, I think men are more selfish than women. <laughs> Girls, talk to me. I think men are. I mean, it's not that we want to be. I think it's just by nature. Like men, girls, listen to me. Girls, listen to me. Men do not really like sharing their food. Like my wife, Carla, 
Carla loves to eat out of my plate. And it's up. And so every now and then I'll kind of like scoot over and, and like just the other night she goes, oh, let me try that. Now, this is how funny my wife is. We'll be in some city at the end of the world. We'll be in Timbuktu at some little cafe. And she's looking at the menu. And she'll, and she'll, and she'll order something. And then she'll try to help me order. And so I'll order something. And she starts eating under my plate because she don't like what she ordered. And I go, I go like, what are you doing? And she goes, well, next time we're here, I might order this. Next, we ain't never coming back here again. What do you mean next time? What do you mean next time we're here in Timbuktu and in this cafe, I might order this? My son hates the story, Jesse, but he's not here. He's with the junior high. But when I, first time I told the story, he was mad at me. Thanks a lot, Dad. Throw me under the bus. When Jesse was about maybe seven, I'm home. It's like, it's like I'm watching a game. I'm, I'm comfortable. Carla's out and about with Sarah somewhere. And, Dad, I'm hungry. Would you take me to McDonald's? I was like, well, can't you make a sandwich in there? Like, no, there's nothing in there. I want a McDonald's. I want a happy meal. <laughs> it wasn't that far away. So I put my, you know, got my, put my shoes on. I got a little attitude, you know. Now, this was January, and I used to fast 30, 21 days, 30, sometimes 40 days. I used to fast. I'd get so skinny. You guys thought I was, had some disease. And I used, to, I used to fast a lot more than I do now. And it's like, it's like I was over the three, four day hunger pain. So I'm doing, I'm kind of doing okay on this fast. Not, it was not, it was like Daniel fast, you know, nuts, fruits, vegetables, and no meat, no, you know, all that stuff. So we get to McDonald's and what's the, what's that smell that hits you when you first walk into McDonald's? What is, ta- say what? God, it's the, de- the devil, man. Anyway. So I walk in there and that's one of the reasons I didn't want to go because I'm, I'm weak, you know. And I, and, I, and I walk in like, oh, God. And what do you want? He goes, I want the Happy Meal, you know, and, and a coat, whatever. So he's sitting there, and I'm, I'm looking at it. And under my breath, is like, God, forgive me. But even, though, even though it's a vegetable, it's fried in all kinds of... I said, just give Dad one of those French fries. And he does this. Get your own, Dad. I said, Jesse, get, give, me, give me one. Get your own, Dad. I'm hungry. I go, I want one French fry. One. He starts crying. Now, now people are looking like. Oh, shh, shh. <laughs> get your own. He started to brace his voice a little. Get your own. So I, didn't, I, I just sat there. And this is what popped into my head. You reap what you sow. It's a law of Bible says you reap what you sow. And well, lo and behold, we're not back home 30 minutes. And his little friend Rocky next door had the new little Game Boy. Remember the Game Boy? So Jesse comes in. Dad, Rocky has a Game Boy. Dad, would you buy me a Game Boy? And I said, get your own. And he's like, what? They get your own. I said, you wouldn't give one. You wouldn't give one French fry to your earthly father. The clothes you have on, I bought. Those shoes, I bought. This house. And he's just staring at me like, Come on, Rocky, let's go play. Like, now we laugh. But every service, when we pass the bucket, I see people do this. God don't need my money. This church don't need my money. And yet, the same people. Oh, God, help me with my rent. God, help me with my car payment. God, help me. And you know what God does? Get your own. <laughs> Get your own. Maybe, I don't know. I can't speak for God, but that's what I'd do. Maybe not. God's merciful. Watch now. (laughs) 
Deuteronomy 15 and 9. Jess is going to hate me again today. Well, just, Deuteronomy 15 and 9. Beware, lest there be a wicked thought in your heart. See, selfishness is like this. It's like this real quick. Before we give, we're challenged, heart for the house, or we're challenged. Selfish, a spirit of selfishness is trying to get in. Like, no, don't, 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 don't do that. You need this. Don't, it's Christmas. You don't, you don't. That's. And if we do give, sometimes, then a spirit of pride tries to get in. Well, I'm a, I'm a giver. I'm standing for my hundredfold return. Then we get greedy. Now it's all about my return. Not I'm helping people. I'm helping God's church. I'm helping poor people. Now it's like, well, I gave a hundred bucks. Bless God, I'm waiting for my hundredfold return. I'm standing, I'm standing on the word. Now, it's okay to believe, but for that to be the focal point, for that to be the only reason we give is to get it back, you know, it's, it's pride. It's, it's pride. Then there's regret or grieving. Watch now. Beware lest, <laughs> beware lest there be a wicked thought in your heart saying, the year of release is at hand. And if I, in other words, if I give my brother or loan my brother, he's going he's to be out of debt according to the law and I'm not going to give it back. You shall surely give to him and your heart should not be grieved. Don't, don't be grieved when you give because for this thing, the Lord God will bless you in all your works and in all to which you set your hand to. Well, stand up with me, everybody. Steve Hage preached a sermon one time about giver's regret. <laughs> he said he was at a church and the preacher was preaching good and there was a great need and him and Daniel were just struggling. And I think they wrote out a check for like $1,000 and that was every dime they had. And they're crying and they're excited. They bring the check up and they, you know, all that stuff. And Steve said, I'm going out to my car. And I went, oh my God. He said, Daniel had to catch me. I'm fall, I'm fading. <laughs> there was no drop cloths. There was no, you know. And he said, I got in my car. I'm like, what have I just done? What have I just done? I've given our last dime. What have I just done? And Daniel said, Steve, Steve, God's going to bless us. God's going to take care of us. Steve, and he said, he said, because Steve was raised in poverty, you know, he was a trailer, trailer trash kid, he says, and, and, and lived in government cheese. He said, don't ever try to make a, a grilled cheese sandwich because government cheese doesn't melt. <laughs> and, and he said, we were so poor, and now that God's given us a little something, he said, but, but I felt the Holy Spirit, I have felt the Holy Spirit say, go ahead and, go ahead and, and, and give everything you have in the bank. But he said, by the time I got to my car, I was like, I was grieving. And he said, my wife had to pre preach that off me because I was going to be robbed of my blessing. And, and if he, you might have been here as a few years ago. And what happened after that, well, it was amazing. It's amazing. Amazing. So let's, let's guard against selfishness. In other words, one of the reasons, I said this last week, one of the reasons... They were called hard-hearted and stiff-necked, God's people Israel, because they wouldn't, they wouldn't turn and look for need. Like my neighbor's hurting, I'm going to go help him. My brother's, my brother's in trouble, I'm going to go help him. No, they were stiff-necked, which means they looked at just their life, my life and mine, just me and mine. That's all that counts, which turned their heart to stone. And then they got into idolatry and everything else and became extremely selfish people. And again, when I tell you, come on people, you know, you come to church, and if you can bring an offering, why? Because it softens our heart. It makes our heart open to this hurting world. It's amazing how we do things. We give time, we give our talent, and we give our treasure. And we, we lift our voice and we sing. Sometimes we even lift our hands without shame or embarrassment, especially us men. Or we cry during a service because our heart was touched and we don't care who sees us. That's when you know God's working on your heart. Amen. Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry Christmas. Before you go... Before you go, I got, give me two minutes to change your life, to change your eternity. Every head bowed just for a very short time. Everything I've just said or read or teached or preached or taught or reached, 
doesn't mean a hill of beans unless you're born again. Unless you've invited Christ into your heart. It's just religious rhetoric and jumbo, mumbo jumbo to you. But maybe you don't even know why you're here, you're here. Somebody brought you and you're hearing the gospel maybe clearly for the first time and you're feeling something. I know I was there in 1977, I was there. My heart was pounding, I was feeling, I didn't know what it was, but it was, it was Jesus knocking at the door of my heart saying, let me in, let me change your life. Let me introduce you to my father. We wanna spend eternity with you. There's a heaven to gain, hell to shun, blessings waiting for you. And I remember, I was the only one. I was the only one to lift my hand. I actually walked down and got prayed for in front of people. I was not embarrassed. I just wanted my life changed. I was grateful for God raising my wife basically from the dead. When I got a 10 day old daughter sitting over here who I would, I don't know where I'd be if Carla died that day. I was grateful and I wanted to show it. So I did what the Bible said. I gave my heart to Christ. So, but maybe today in the balcony down here, maybe you've never done that. The Bible says today is the day of your salvation. What does that mean? It means tomorrow is not guaranteed. You still have breath, you still have a heartbeat. I can't promise you tomorrow, any of us will. That's why the Bible says do it now, do it now, do it now, secure your eternity now while God's talking to you, while the Holy Spirit's dealing with you. Do it now, do it right now. You need God in your life, lift your hand, lift your hand. You need God, you need God right now, lift your hand. You need God today, you need God today. Thank you, the balcony. You need God today. Just, just, you need God today. I need Jesus in my life today, today. Lots of you. Look this, look this way, everybody. A lot of people raise their hand. That's step one. Step one, I surrender. In fact, there was a whole family of four last service. They just, all of them lifted their hand. Beautiful family of four. Gosh, I remember 1977. Dick Brunel lifted his hand. I wanted Jesus. Tamaya, I wanted Jesus. I wanted, I wanted Jesus in my life. I want to pray with these people, but I want you to pray with them. What a, what a way to end the year. What a way to start a new year. Brand new, new creature in Christ, new creation, born again, given a, give a new lease on life. Yeah. Yeah. I mean... Being able, being able to talk to God every day like a friend and a father without shame, guilt, condemnation, to boldly come to his grace, to boldly come to the throne room and say, Dad, it's me. It's me again. I got to talk to you. Jesus, we need to talk. Holy Spirit, you need to help me. It's fun. It's fun to live with God. It's an adventure. Now, now there's problems, there's challenges. We still live in the flesh. We still live in the world. There's still devils and principalities and powers. There's still all that, but I'll teach you how to have authority over that. You stick around this church a little while. I'll teach you. Let's all pray this, and then we're going to go. Ready? Here we go. And then I hope to see all of you Thursday night. And Carl and I, we like to go out and take pictures with you, shake your hand Thursday night, and, and love on you a little bit. Bring your family, friends, kids, babies. Bring everybody, and we'll just pack this place out with a lot of love on Thursday night. One hour service. At six, and I'll get you out of here at seven o'clock. I promise. Ready? Let's pray this. Father in heaven, Father in heaven today, today is the day, is the day of, salvation. of salvation. It's my day. It's my day. 1241, 1241. December, the 20th, December the 20th, I am, I am born, again. born again. I'm saved. I'm, saved. I'm, a, child I'm a child of God. And from this day on, from this, day from on, this very second on, this very second on I'll never be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto my salvation. I'm gonna do my best, Lord. Find me a good Bible-believing church. Gonna get me a Bible. I'm gonna read it. I'm gonna pray. I'm gonna tell somebody. Someday I'm gonna tell everybody. I was lost and now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. I was dead. Now I'm alive forevermore. In Jesus' name. Is there any amens out there? Amen. Amen, amen, amen.